Well, on today's menu is the MSI M7 X470 Gaming AC. X470 Gaming M7 AC. God, the, the names get longer and longer. Ah, it's an AM4 motherboard for 2000 series uh, AMD CPUs. You know, it'll probably work with newer CPUs. It's also backward compatible with 1000 CPUs. Man, testing X470 is hard because there's a lot of stuff with X470. I mean, it's, well, I mean, strictly speaking, it's really an incremental improvement over X370, but a lot of the teething and polish issues that were perhaps missing from the first generation X370 boards, you've got it in X470. So it's hard to just say, okay, here's all the features, how, here's how everything works. You really gotta go through everything. And also the overclocking works completely differently. We're gonna go through all the features and all the stuff that I like about it. A couple of things that I don't really like about it. But so far in testing, the 2700X and the 2600X, it's been really solid. It's actually worked really well. Also done Linux testing, IOMMU testing, device testing, throughput, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's take a look. So what have we got in terms of board layout? Well, it's pretty standard for X470. You've got two by 16 slots that are wired directly into the CPU, and you've got another by 16 slot physically that's by four electrically that's wired through the X470 chipset, which means that that slot's gonna run at PCI Express 2.0 by four. You've also got a plurality of PCI Express by one slots for any of your other PCI Express by one peripherals that you might be running, and those all work fine. Those go through the chipset, not a big deal. We've got two M.2 slots that are under this sort of twin frozer giant heat sink thing. And one of them is PCI Express 3.0 wired directly into the CPU, that's four lanes. The other one is also PCI Express uh, 2.0 uh, four lanes wired through the chipset. So that one's a little slower than the other one, but for, you know, if you're gonna run a SATA M.2, you can put it there because it's also wired for SATA. If you're gonna run an older, slower M.2, that'll work just fine with the PCI Express 2.0 interface. Now these built-in heat spreaders are pretty cool if you've got an NVMe, you know, like the uh, Samsung 950 or the Toshiba RD400 that's just, you know, the gum stick memory. But if you've got an M.2 that has a built-in heat spreader, like the uh, Adata XPG, or you're running something like Intel Optane, you know, I've got my Optane 900P with my M.2 adapter for that. This is an M.2 card that actually just clips right into the motherboard but as you can see that there's there's no way that this heatsink thing will close with that installed. And so to remove it, you've got to take the heatsink completely off and unscrew it from the other side. It's, a, it's sort of a pain. I mean, I can appreciate the coolness of the heat spreader, but bear that in mind if you're going to get a fancy pants M.2, like the uh, Adata XPG or this style of Optane. Two things that I'll note about the expansion slot layout. The first is that the first by 16 slot is shifted down one. There's a PCI Express by one slot above that, but that's gonna give you more clearance for any type of like tower cooler that you might wanna run on this motherboard. Second thing is that if you've got a two and a half slot or a three slot graphics card, it, you can use that on this motherboard and it's not gonna block your other PCI Express by 16 slot that's wired into the CPU. So that's great if you wanna run SLI or Crossfire. They're both supported on this motherboard for two graphics devices. So that should work out really well. Now in terms of connector layout on this motherboard, it's pretty cool. You've got six four pin fan headers. You get three up in the CPU area, one sort of at the rear IO area, and one along the bottom edge of the motherboard. There's also one at the front edge of the motherboard at just below the 24 pin power connector. At the front of the motherboard, you've got six, six gigabit per second SATA ports and one right angle USB 3.0 port. On the bottom of the motherboard, you've got an additional USB 3.0 port. Well, it's USB 3.1 Gen 1, the protocol, but it's the old style 30 pin header. And then you've also got the USB Type-C header for USB Type-C front panels as well. If you're gonna run an M7, you know, if you're gonna run the M7 AC with a case that's got USB Type-C front panel, or even if you're not, you can get a, a, you know, an expansion slot to use in the back with the USB Type-C reversible connector. We've got power and reset, and then we've got the, the MSI overdrive thingy, the auto overclock knob, where you can turn it up to 11, just like Spinal Tap. So this is literally Spinal Tap's motherboard. Turn it up to 11, because that's your auto overclock knob. I did mess around with that. The overclocking options on Ryzen 7 2000 series CPUs are kind of limited right now. You can do all core overclocks, which are well beyond the base clock of 3.7 gigahertz. But in terms of an all core overclock exceeding 4.3 gigahertz, 
that's uh, that's a unicorn of overclocking. You're gonna need liquid nitrogen or something, something really beefy in order to do that. Now, if you mess with the front side bus clock speed or the independent, you know, the, the you know, an independent clock source, you can totally do that. And guess what? This motherboard has the independent clock source, so you can run you know, your overclocks without overclocking the bus. It does introduce a tiny bit more latency between memory and the CPU, but you can, you know, do your base clock overclocking with this board, and that's totally fine. Other notable connectors on this motherboard. We've got two USB 2.0 front panel headers also at the bottom of the board, a front panel connection. Got, a, you know, an RGB connection, front panel audio, standard stuff really. Got the diagnostic LED readout at the front bottom corner. Got the digital RGB LED strip for the you know bottom right corner of the board as well. There's also the Corsair header. So if you're running Corsair cooling or Corsair accessories, you can use the three pin Corsair interface. It's totally provided right on the motherboard at the top edge. So, you know, good to pair Corsair accessories with this particular motherboard if you want to use the Corsair digital interface thingy. For power input, it's got two eight pin power connectors. Uh, you don't have to use both of them. Both of them is definitely overkill. The VRM situation on this X470 board is re-engineered from the last gen. I think that, that there was sort of cautious optimism on the X370 boards and the X470 boards, the board designers have sort of embraced AMD. So the VRM solution here, it's not the most overkill VRM solution that I've seen, but real world, absolute max that you're gonna be pushing through that 2700X, the top in the flagship CPU for the socket, at least as of this video, is gonna be 200 watts. Nominal is like 140 with your boost and everything else working, but really, I mean, even like 140, you know, it's a TDP 105 watt part, but 140 watts. 160 watts with modest overclocking, and 160 watts is right on the edge of what the, uh, the Wraith Prism cooler is able to sort of dissipate in terms of heat in my own informal testing. But yeah, I mean, you can push 180, 200 watts, something like that. This VRM will deliver all of that and more. It looks like a 14 phase um, power VRM solution. If you're more interested in the, uh, uh, in the VRM particulars, you know, which, which MOSFETs and you know, which power system is it based on, all that sort of thing, check the level one forums. There's a link to the article that goes with this video in the description. So, cool, you know, I'm into that too when it's like a forensic analysis as opposed to, yep, it's overkill, sounds good, move on. For the rear I.O., it's pretty standard for what, you know, you would expect on an AMD motherboard, except for the clear CMOS and BIOS upgrade buttons. This, I think, because AM4 is a long-lived platform and because, you know, AMD has done some pretty Herculean things, like if you get a CPU, a new CPU to try to use it with an old motherboard, of course it's not going to post. And so AMD, if you call them, they will say, okay, go to your local micro center or go to your local retailer that AMD has partnered with to upgrade your motherboard with an older CPU. If there's not one in your area, AMD will totally send you a loaner CPU that's like super crappy, but good enough to flash your BIOS so that you can get it upgraded and then you can swap in your new CPU. But that's a hassle and a headache and nobody really wants to do that. Some motherboards feature this like BIOS button on the back or it may be a header on the motherboard or something like that. When you, do, when, when you have this header on your motherboard, what it means is you can put a new BIOS on a USB stick, and even with no CPU in the motherboard, plug the USB stick into the motherboard, hit that button, and your motherboard will look for a certain file on the USB stick and say, oh, that's a new BIOS for me. And it'll flash itself with no CPU from the BIOS file that's on the USB stick. I really, as long lived as the AM4 platform is, I think AMD should really ask for that feature from a lot of their board partners. We got a PS2 combo, mouse and keyboard. So some people are into that, myself included, the Model M. Two USB 2.0 headers. Then we got two USB 3.0, that's USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports. Our Intel 802.11 AC wireless solution, two more USB 3.0, USB 3.1 Gen 1, the protocol interface. Then we've got our USB 3.2, well, it's 3.1 Gen 2, sorry, 3.1 Gen 2, uh, type A and type C. Then we've got our killer 2500 NIC. Yeah, it's a killer NIC uh, on top. And our Realtek ALC 1220 based audio solution with uh, gold plated connectors and optical SPDIF out. Now this does have a separate uh, impedance auto sensing DAC for headphones. 
It's Nehemic Audio. So if you're looking for the Nehemic Audio suite to mess with surround and virtual surround and configure all the stuff, it does have the Nehemic Audio suite. Looks pretty cool. I played with it, seems to work fine. Now, one of the things that we're gonna start doing with the X470 motherboards to help to differentiate, you know, motherboard features and that kind of thing. We already do the UEFI tour and uh, you know, AMD sort of provides their standard set of, of features. You know, when the, when the CPU manufacturer embraces overclocking, it turns out it's pretty good because uh, a lot of the board manufacturers incorporate a lot of the same features for overclocking. Now, all of the different board partners also have their, you know, special sauce that they have for overclocking, but having the consistent AMD support for overclocking is a pretty cool thing. So subjectively, uh, some of the things that separate the X470 boards from other X470 boards this time around is a little bit VRM implementation, though definitely not as much separation as there was in the X370. I mean, the X370 boards, like there was a huge spectrum of VRM implementation on X370 and almost as huge of a spectrum on B350. The B350 tended toward the lower end, which makes sense. It's a low, I mean, B350 is not meant to be a top end thing. So with the VRM situation basically ironed out, and the UEFI being pretty consistent in terms of overclocking options that you have for the 2000 series Ryzen CPUs. What separates motherboards today? Well, want board layout, PCI Express, bundled peripherals, things that are built into the motherboard, and memory. Memory timings and how fast you can get it to go with different memory configurations. So on all of our X470 boards, I'm gonna to try to test what is our fastest dual channel configuration because you, you don't wanna run single channel. Ryzen really likes fast memory. Our fastest quad channel configuration and our fastest dual channel configuration with a first gen Ryzen CPU. So I'm gonna spare you the insanity of all of that. But on this motherboard with our DD, uh, Trident Z DDR4 4000 kit, which normally has timings of uh, 19, 18, 18, 36, we were able to run at 3866, not 4000, with timings of 17, 16, 16, 32. So yeah, if you don't have the memory clocked as high, you can mess with the timings and get there. We did a spreadsheet on that a long time ago. Uh, there's a, somebody wrote a program that works really similar and it's more comprehensive called the Rising, uh, Ryzen Memory Timing Calculator Program. You should check that out, that's a thing. So that's cool, you know, dual channel, 3866. But what about quad channel? What if you need to run quad channel? Well, we're gonna do the worst case scenario quad channel test. We got the G-Skill Sniper, memory like honestly you, you can get the 3200 memory kit for the second gen cpus we've done i've done a bunch of testing on a bunch of different x470 boards it just so happens that the, the m7 ac is one of my favorite boards so far and it's also the first one that we're getting the review out for and ddr4 3200 is not a problem at all on dual channel configuration like you should just get the g skill 3200 kit and call it a day and just be really happy with your memory 3400 and 3666 and and beyond is attainable, but it's gonna depend on your CPU and it's gonna depend on some other stuff. Now, officially, 2933, that is the official supported speed for these CPUs. So you should be guaranteed 2933 on these boards. And these boards officially support 2933 on every X470 board I've tested so far. Not really an issue, but 3200, pretty easily attainable. And that's kind of a big deal because on X370, it was a lot, it was a lot harder to do. So I'm kind of create a worst case scenario and our Vengeance Corsair memory. It's a different brand, it's different timings. I think this is actually Hynix memory because of the way that the timings are. I wouldn't swear to that, but um, yeah, it's not, it's not a good situation mixing. These are also different sizes. These are two four gig sticks versus our eight gig sticks that are in there. So we will have 24 gigs of memory. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Total in this system, but the question is, what are the timings that we're gonna get with all four sticks populated? Because hey, not a lot of people are doing that. Now I've already done this about two dozen times. <laughs> and the trick with this is don't be afraid to just reseat your memory. Literally just take out all your memory and put it back again. The tolerances for doing stuff is really, really tight on the sockets and just the slightest difference in the way that the memory is inserted can be the difference between a system that won't post or a system that's stable 
or a system that's unstable. If you're really unlucky, you might have to reseat the CPU, take everything apart, redo the thermal paste in your CPU, and then put it all back together and then put your memory in and then bloop, all of a sudden, everything is working. Now with all four sticks of memory in the system, you know, officially that 2933 speed comes down. You know, we're talking like 1866 in the worst case scenario with dual ranked DIMMs because, you know, if you're running 16 gigs, it's like two eight gig sticks stacked on one physical, uh, one physical stick of memory. And the way that the addressing works with that is that the CPU can address the sort of the, the first row of memory on that uh, on that stick of memory or the second row of memory or set ranks is what that's called. And so you can get to the first rank or the second rank. But when the first rank is busy looking up something, you can also do something with the second rank. And so if you can, it's better to get two 16 gig sticks of memory as opposed to four eight gig sticks of memory, both of those total to 32 gigabytes of memory. And as you can hear, because I'd cleared the CMOS on this thing, it's booted about five or six different times because it's, oh, it's trying to find those memory timings to work. Oh, it's trying. So the best we were able to obtain with about an hour of stability was 2667 with all four sticks of memory, which is very, very respectable. That's really, honestly, that's quite good. 2667 with four sticks of memory, we've mixed one command rate memory with two command rate memory, which is sort of a no-no, and uh, you know, the, the, the Corsair memory is memory that I've had for a while. It's kind of ancient and sort of old school. DDR4 is more problematic to get working on new school Ryzen because Ryzen, you just want to use new modern memory with Ryzen just because it's newer and more modern itself. And some of the things with the command rate and the timings and that, and that sort of thing. That said, if you have a matched kit where all four sticks of memory are the same, you are going to have a better time. <laughs> it's going to be easier for you. This is just a demonstration that in a worst case scenario, you can still get better than the 1866. And a lot of that is owing to improvements that AMD has made in the integrated memory controller and the dramatic improvements board partners like MSI have made with their X470 motherboard. So yeah, 24 gigabytes of memory, working pretty good at 2666. Now, as I said before, the fastest dual channel configuration that we had was 3866. That was with our DDR4 4000 kit, DDR4 4000 wouldn't post, but that doesn't mean you can't take advantage of the speed of DDR4 4000. If it won't clock that high, then just lower the clock latency or lower the, the timings on the memory using the Ryzen RAM calculator or, uh, you know, some motherboards have the Ryzen RAM calculator built in. This MSI motherboard has memory try it. So when you bring up the memory try it menu, It'll give you a whole bunch of preset options and timings, and so you can sort of use that to hunt and peck your way around better memory timings. Be sure to run benchmarks to make sure that you've actually improved the situation. Well, wouldn't you know it, they came out with a new Agiza. The new Agiza, the new BIOS, this is T7, the revision from, from MSI from 413 of 2018, at least that's what it was dated. And yeah, you can get the memory faster than 2666. We're up to 2800, and it's pretty stable. So let's do some benchmarks. With the upgraded memory speed, to loosen the timings a little bit, but we've moved from a latency of 77 nanoseconds to 73 nanoseconds. And at the stock 1866, memory benchmark is about 27 gigabytes per second, 27 and a half, something like that. Now, even with four sticks of memory in here, we're at a blistering 42.6 gigabytes per second. That is smoking fast for a four dim setup. The IOMMU situation is pretty good. Most of the peripherals, although not all of them, that go through the Promontory chipset are in the same IOMMU group. So if you want to pass through a USB controller or something like that, you're out of luck because those are all sort of grouped together in one group. But the M.2 and the two PCI Express slots that are wired directly to the CPU, they are in isolated IOMMU groups. The wireless networking and the wired networking are in another different IOMMU group along with some other peripherals. So if you, if you wanted to run cubes or something like that, you probably need the ACS patch for the, the, uh, the NICs, which I think it's bundled with anyway at this point. So not really a big deal there. Um, in terms of the, the other, well, you should just check out the screenshot. So here's the IOMMU groups in the default configuration with this thing populated with two M.2 devices and two by, two by 16 uh, devices and another device in the 
uh, PCI Express by one slot. Well, there you have it, the MSI X470 Gaming M7AC. If you pick up one of these, I wanna know what your memory timings are. What memory kit did you buy? What was the fastest memory speed that you could get? Please post in the level one forums so that everybody that's thinking about buying this motherboard can benefit from your experience. We tried mainly G-Skill memory, a little bit of Corsair memory, at pretty much every speed from 29, well, no, like 1866, from 1866 on the low end, all the way up to DDR4 4000. That was a lot of fun. We also tried A Data memory. We had some A Data, you know, quad channel 2400. It's a full kit. Worked fine. The A Data 2400, all four DIMMs at 2400. You just plug it in, plug in the voltage. Good to go. So, yeah. If you like this, you know, you should thumbs up and subscribe and all that kind of stuff. If you didn't like it, well, you can thumbs down too. I don't know. You should come hang out on the forums at level one. We're not all bad. At least I. I don't think we are. Maybe we are. I don't know. We'll see. So Wendell, I'm signing out and I'll see you there.